So guys, good morning and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. For those of you who don't know, my name is Jamie and you will have the pleasure of my company for the next three hours. And on camera with me I have Jandre and he's going to be keeping us entertained with hopefully some wonderful images of this morning's drive. And we've got Tara and Lou in FC keeping us together. And it is a very, very nippy morning here on Juma Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands. It is 9 degrees centigrade, which is 8 degrees Fahrenheit, so definitely feeling a bit of a nip in the air. So, just a little bit of an update for those of you who might have missed yesterday's sunset safari. Now, I'm not sure what Wendy and Jigo were talking about when they were parked before the drive yesterday afternoon, but they both decided that they were, they'd had enough I'm not sure if it was the combination of the cheetah sightings and then the wild dog sightings that we had yesterday, but Wendy decided not to move and then Jigger decided not to move and we had to do some very quick bush mechanics. So thanks to James's mechanical genius and thinking, we were able to get Wendy back into gear. And for those of you who are mechanically minded, basically the diff lock and the high range, low range selector sheared off somewhere tucked down in the bowels of Wendy and we were able to tug it with a rope and get it back into gear. Unfortunately that means no low range for Wendy and we are on Wendy today. Jigger has sheared off bolts between the steering column and the steering bar so the right wheel is a doo -doo 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 and definitely out of commission for the morning. So we are working on it, we will try and get both cars up and running but unfortunately it looks as though Jig is going to need a little bit more TLC than Wendy and is probably going to be out of commission until sometime tomorrow. So for now we have three hours of us and we're going to have a wonderful time driving around. I've just been to check the hyena den. Unfortunately it looks as though they've moved which is something we've suspected for the last two days. There's absolutely no tracks coming in or out but there are tracks leading into the block on my right so we're going to go and just check around, see if maybe we can get a good idea of what's happening there. And just for a quick update, I know that many of you will by now have heard about the very sad case of the Inkahuma lioness who was killed by one of the Birminghams. Very, very sad story. And the Inkahumas were seen drinking at Inkoro last night and apparently then tried to push up back to that buffalo carcass and were chased away by the Birminghams. As far as we know, luckily no injuries last night. They all seem to be present and accounted for, but they are still across our boundary. So I know that many of you would have been concerned. It is a very sad, sad situation. Unfortunately, just one of those realities that happens out here in the wild. And one that I know is a devastating loss for the Inkahumas. However, they are across our boundaries and it's time to see what else is happening out here. So let us see if we can go and find some hyena activity. I know that Brent and James are not going to be sitting idly by while we are out this morning. They're going to be out on tracking team, hopefully helping us to find something. And I'm sure at some point we will bump into them and they'll say hello to you all, just to get you some variety from my particular face and voice. All of the animals are tucked away still, trying to warm up. from Karen and lots of other viewers on the chat rooms to say that they heard roaring on the Juma Dam camera last night so we'll definitely be following up on that and also the reports of the Inkahuma pride at the, on the Inkoro Dam coming to drink so I'm sure that 
suppose that is the pie that I heard reports of. It was definitely them. They were seen drinking there. And their numbers seem to be somewhat depleted. I believe there were seven, which would tie in with that death of the one lioness. But at least we know that the rest of the pride is intact for now. And although it's very, very difficult to predict, it's very difficult to predict exactly what is going to happen over the next few weeks. I must say I was fairly surprised by the actions of the Birmingham boys. I thought they were a little bit young, but they obviously took their chance while the Matimba males were away. And essentially what seems like hap what happened yesterday or last two nights ago at some point, the Inkahumas killed a buffalo and they were feeding on it and the Birminghams came to steal it and unfortunately one lioness did not make it out in time and one of the males killed her and then fed on her a little bit which is not not unheard of it's fairly unusual for them to commit cannibalism but it is not unheard of so he did feed on her a bit and then the body was found was yesterday morning by Taxon I believe so a very very sad situation it is one of those things that just does happen the Birminghams are obviously trying to ass assert their authority and it's impossible to predict but I think the next few weeks are going to be particularly hard on Junior he is going to have to make himself scarce if the Birminghams are moving into that area it will be time to go for young Junior So you would have heard me talking about the Matimba males and they are the two dominant males in this area. They come from a slightly larger coalition, I believe, but they are the two that are regularly seen. And Mavis from Florida, welcome to the Sunrise Safari. Now Mavis has been doing some research into the family trees of the various prides in this area and she would like to know a little bit more about the Matimba's background. And I think that's fantastic work that you've been doing, Mavis, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. Unfortunately, I've only been working here for about a month, so I'm still getting a handle on where these lions come from. Now, the fact that they are called the Matimba males, to me, implies that they are from the Matimba, uh, Matimba pride. However, where they've come from, I'm not sure if they pushed up from the south or the north of our area. But they are two lions that are sort of eight to nine years of age. The other one, I think, is a little bit older, maybe around 10. And I'm sure many of the viewers have a little bit more information on that. And I'm sure Mavis would love to hear it, and I certainly would. So guys, if you have any info, you can send it through to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or to questions at wildearth.tv. And if you are joining us for the first time, we have some amazing stories of some really incredible animals and it's so, so cool that we get to follow them from birth and follow their stories and their various pride dynamics and the leopard dynamics. It's really, really interesting. But this is a live safari. So what you are seeing is what is happening right now on the Sabi Sands, the um, Juma Game Reserve at the moment. And if you have any questions, it doesn't matter what the subject is, you are more than welcome to send them through to us on hashtag safari live on twitter and to questions at wildearth.tv and i am very very keen to hear from you So 
Now I'm getting some updates on the Matimba Pri oh, the Matimba Coalition. And apparently they were first spotted in Manuleti side, which is north and east of us. And they were spotted there in 2011, a coalition of six large males. And two of them sort of hang around the Sabi Sands region. That is, they're occasionally joined by a third member. And then obviously we have the two that we see regularly, which is Hairy Belly and the Ginger the Timber Male. And those two animals in particular are starting to reach the end of their pride. Um, I know that the Ginger Male has quite an injury to his paw. There's a bit of contention about how he got it, whether it was a snake bite or whether he's got something stuck in it and he's just repeatedly keeping it open by licking it. But they are starting to um, they are starting to be challenged by the Birmingham boys. And unfortunately pride takeovers don't happen with necessarily with one big fight. There's a build up of weeks and weeks worth of sort of challenging and the various lions getting to know each other's strengths and deciding whether or not they want to risk a big conflict. So we're going to be seeing a lot of interesting happenings. And of course there's no guarantees that the Birminghams will decide to take over this area. They could move back north into Manuleti. They could push further south. It's impossible to predict at this point. Although it does look as though over the past few weeks they are spending more and more time around Juma and then around Torchwood as well. So all areas that the Inkahuma Pride have been seen in regularly. And for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, the Matimba male lions also associate with the Styx Pride, which, which is a pride that sort of splits into a couple of different groups, and they're generally seen to the south or in Arethusa, so the south or to the west of us. And one female has some very, very young cubs at the moment. So she's going to have to make sure to keep them far, far out of the reach of those males. And we do have quite an extraordinary view here on this chilly, chilly morning. Really, really beautiful way to start the morning. Just the mist in all of those low-lying areas. So, a really beautiful, quiet morning. A lot of the birds seem to still be asleep, but we could hear that crested barbet trilling away in the background. I heard a white-browed scrub robin, which is one of my favorite little whistling calls. I can hear some drongos chirping away, as well as the sort of distant call of the grey go away birds. Also seeing lots and lots of hyena tracks on the road in front of me. And we are very close to an old den site, so hopefully we can find some action there. So, a truly beautiful morning and we're going to start to see the change of season coming in fairly soon. At the moment it's typical August weather, it's very, very dry, 
there's at the moment it's nice and still but generally each day is a bit blustery a bit blowy a bit windy and it's exciting to know that the seasons are changing the days are getting longer and hopefully this will spell the end of a very very dry season for the animals We've still got another two or three months of it until the big rains come but I'm hoping that the rains this year will be a little bit more enthusiastic than they were last year now I just want to poke my nose into this dead site and you see what's happening there as I said I've got a fair amount of tracks on the road in front of me and they do look for, like they did were sort of here from last night so let's see if we can sneak in here just have a look. Now unfortunately it took James and Brent's combined, combined strength to get Windy into high range gear. So low range I think might be out of the question. We needed to use a series of ropes and interesting clutch control to try and just jolt it back into place. I don't want to risk now displacing it. So we shall be in high range for the duration of this drive. We've been talking a little bit obviously about the death of this Nkuhuma Pride um, female and Mary Ann from Boston has got a very good question for us. She would like to know that if the Birmingham boys intention is to dominate the Pride and to sort of start reproducing, why would they have killed that female and not tried to mate with her? And it was probably something that happened where they got a little bit overly defensive of that buffalo carcass. The Inkahumas probably fought very, very hard to try and defend their kill. And the Birmingham males lost their temper a little bit with her. It is, it's not an uncommon situation. It could also have been that she was pregnant or that they knew that their options were limited in terms of being able to overthrow the Matimba males just yet. So it's a possibility that that was the reason. It's hard to tell. It's not unheard of for males to kill females like this. I think that the fighting instinct kicks in fairly strongly and sometimes results in the death of the females. And she was probably working very hard. We might even have found that they were out to kill the two young sub-adults. Unfortunately, there is no action here at this den site very very quiet now I'm sure that these hyena are in here somewhere but I think that looking for them might be a job for another day because I think we're gonna have to go and walk through this block and try and find them and just to give you an idea of what it is we're looking for I'll stop the car for now so with active den sites you start to look for lots of hyena tracks up and down and you also start to smell it now these tunnels in this den site haven't been excavated in a while they've started to collapse in there's no flies around the entrance, so I think that they have probably not moved to this den. They must have moved somewhere further off into this block, where we've been seeing them running up and down fairly regularly. So I just wanted to give you an update on the den site while we are here. But just to finish off that question, which I think is a very valid one, as to why that lioness might have died, it is guesswork on our part. We don't know. But it could be that the Birmingham boys were actually aiming to kill those two young sub-adult females to bring the females back into estrus, to bring their mother back into estrus. And they are just right at the cusp of the age where they might be left alone. But it could be that that female was trying to defend them or trying to defend Junior and just got in the way. So it's just one possibility, it's one theory, but we don't know for sure. It is something that is recorded in Lion's behavior and it's one thing that we can't fully explain. So, very sad day for her. 
unfortunately we don't know which individual lioness it was. So you'll notice that in keeping with the other hyena den, this is made into a termite mound and or made out of a termite mound, an old abandoned one that the art parks have started and then the hyenas continue to excavate. And Carol from New York, welcome to the Sunrise Safari. Carol would like to know if spotted hyenas always utilize termite mounds as their den. And the answer is generally yes. In all of the times I've seen hyena dens, they have been in termite mounds. I imagine in areas where there might not be as many termite mounds, there's a possibility that they could utilize rock crevices. But it is interesting because they tend to dominate in terms of termite mound usage. But the brown hyena, which is a member of the same family, slightly smaller, different social structure, they will tend to favor rocky crevices that climb up into what is known colloquially as copies, which are sort of little mounds with rocks on them, and they find caves and holes in there, and they den in there. I have seen brown hyena denning in termite mounds, but it's not the norm. So interesting difference between the two species. It makes sense because you want to reduce the competition as much as you can between the two of them. And finding a brown hyena den, let me tell you, is one of the most exciting things. Because brown hyenas tend to be a lot quieter, a lot shyer, and a little bit more retiring than the spotted hyenas, and you don't often get to see them. So I know that when we found one, we actually put up a camera trap at an, at, at, at an active den site that we thought was a spotted hyena den. And when we went back and got the pictures, we had these tiny little brown balls of fluff that turned out to be brown hyena cubs and it was incredibly exciting. Now I'm not sure how many times the viewers on Wild Earth have seen a brown hyena. I believe it's happened at least once. But that is something that would be very, very exciting to see. And there's lots of tracks here so I'm sure that they're in the area. It's just a question of whereabouts they have gone because their tracks are all over the place. Lots of little ones too. So they are here somewhere. A couple of years ago, there was a bit of a fuss in Johannesburg about brown hy a brown hyena that was seen walking the streets and people were amazed that this wild animal was coming through until a group of researchers actually sort of spoke up and said listen we've been monitoring them for years and years this particular family they den under the Galulis interchange or they used to den under the Galulis interchange in Johannesburg, which is one of the biggest highway or free state or interstate sort of connections between Johannesburg, the airport and Pretoria. And they'd been denning there, they'd been the researchers had been watching them for a very long time. So amazing how adaptable the various animals can be. That is fairly unusual, but it does make you wonder how many other animals are wandering through cities. And I know that in Palaboa, where there is a gate entrance to the Kruger, so it borders right on the Kruger, there's often photographs of lions walking down the road past petrol stations, elephants coming out. It does happen. Sure, I'm sure these hyena are here somewhere. The tracks are everywhere. And I heard them calling outside on quarantine clearings last night. So they're definitely around. Just 
be chatting a little bit about hyenas and their dynamics and their den sites that do carry a very pungent odor. And Anne, welcome to the Sunrise Safari. Anne would like to know if there is, if hyenas, spotted hyenas social groom and if they are as fastidious as leopards and lions about cleanliness. And the answer to that is that they do lick each other occasionally, it's part of their bonding ritual. But it's not really so much, I wouldn't describe it as a grooming session per se. But they will lick each other just as a sort of sign of affection, especially between mothers and cubs, obviously. But also between the lower ranking members of the group, they might groom one of the higher ranking ones. But it's more just a greeting than anything else. They don't actually sit and groom in the same way that lions do. And the, I wouldn't say that they are particularly fastidious about their cleaning habits. They do tend to be rather dirty. Uh, we've seen recently with all of the activity at the den, a lot of the females coming back with very bloody faces, bloody fronts, and very muddy. So they're not quite as fastidious. Just making sure that I listen very carefully to the Game Drive channel. Most of the other guides are off towards Torchwood to see what they can follow up with those lions there. But that's good news for us because then we can have some updates. We knew they were there. Thank you. Well spotted, Jandre. Quite literally. Oh, and they're coming to us too. I will move in a little bit closer. I just want to get an idea of the dynamics and just to show you what it is we are looking at. So we knew they were here somewhere. So now we need to make a fairly careful, considered approach to this little family of hyena. And these are our regular clan members that we often see around the den site. I knew they were in this block. So that is great news. So we've got, by the looks of it, we've got the three older cubs. The one is slightly older and then the twins. So seven months and five months, give or take and one adult female. So I need to, I would like to be able to approach, but I'd like to do so fairly carefully, given Wendy's lack of low range gear. So I don't want to scare them off. I think I see my best approach. But very, very cool. So we have found the hyenas. Whether or not their den site is here is highly likely. I think it's probably just off in that drainage line somewhere. But these guys are out and about. So let's see if we can get a little bit closer and see what they are up to this morning. Awesome spot by Jandre. Thank you very much. It's good to see a successful conclusion to our hyena tracking mission. For the moment, the cubs have just dashed off to the right of us, but they will be back. They've 
just gone to explore a little bit. They'll be back soon. And this female looks to be... Which female is this? I think that this is the mother of the twins. Who are now on their way back. Obviously, it's a little bit difficult with spotted hyenas, but we are starting to get to know the three main females and their cubs fairly well. And I think this is the mother of the middle set of cubs. The mother of the oldest cub is a little bit younger than her. And then obviously the mother of the youngest cub, who is too young to be out and about, is the, the one that we suspect is the matriarch of the clan with a big scar on her back and she's seen and she's seen something off in the distance not sure what she's looking at so We've got a question from Lisa who would like to know if maybe these spotted hyenas moved because they picked up on all of the tension from the lions in the area and they moved on. And I don't think so. I think that they moved because their den site was starting to get rather smelly and they were acquiring lots and lots of parasites as you can imagine with several individuals living in one den bringing back carcasses and being slightly less, as we discussed earlier, slightly less fastidious about their cleaning habits. And whatever it is she's seen, she's not terribly phased by. She's just looking off into the distance. And here come the little cubs making their way back. We've decided that it was a little bit far to go without mom's help and support. Hello, little one. Are you coming to say hello? <laughs> and they are terribly, terribly cute. They do have mischief all over their faces. It's one of my favorite things to watch little hyena cubs. So they've, <laughs> they've just moved behind us and they decided that a approach from the rear side of the car might be a good idea. So I just want to keep an eye on what they're doing. The one is coming to sniff the back. And the problem is, if you're joining us for the first time, the problem with hyena cubs, I'm just going to let the break off so that they get a fright a little bit. Um, the problem with little hyena cubs is that they tend to be very, very cheeky in the way that they approach vehicles, and they love to explore their new world. And they usually do so with their teeth, which, now listen, little hyena cub, Wendy's struggling enough as it is. We don't need you to contribute to that. I'm just waiting for the sort of telltale nibbling sounds. <laughs> but maybe they're starting to outgrow that particular thing. Hello. What are you doing? Let me just have a look at whatever this one is up to. Yeah. You naughty. You're coming to chew the tire, hey? Phew. Cheeky little ones. You're so brave now. You're so brave. So I'm going to try and have eyes in the back of my head at the same time um, because there are some cheeky little monsters circling us. And definitely with that expression on their face like they are either have done something wrong or they are about to. I'm just going to crane my head over the side here just to see that they're not stealing the cap off the edge of my wheel. monsters. So hyena cubs are definitely one of my 
favorite animals to watch. As many of the regulars might know, spotted hyenas are my favorite predator, my favorite carnivore. They are highly, highly entertaining. And they are so curious and so, so intelligent. And their dynamics can be so interesting. So while we're looking at them, and we know that they probably have a den somewhere in this area, Risa would like to know if I've ever found any hyena dens at Arethusa, or if we know of any in that area. Now, I'm sure there must be. They almost are certainly denning in that area. But we haven't heard any reports of it yet. And if they are, it will be a different clan to the one that we have here. Listen, monster. Uh-uh. And I'm staring straight into this little one's eyes at the moment. Hey! Hey! And he's chewing my tire. He or she. Oh, you cheeky. You are so cheeky. <laughs> and again, hey! Uh-uh. No. Naughty, naughty little monsters. <laughs> and that's one of my favorite things about them is they are so cheeky. And they are so curious. Unfortunately, I do have to shout at them every now and again. But you can see how quickly they recognize tone. So when I'm talking normally like this, there's no response. But the minute I start to say, hey, change the tone a little bit, lean out, you can see immediately there's a reaction from them. And this little one's decided that since it can't chew my tire, it's going to chew that poor defenseless twig. So I'm sure that there are I'm sure that there are den sites in Arethusa. Sorry, Raisa, to continue your question. We haven't heard any reports yet, but it is a very, very nice area for hyenas. So I'm sure that they're around there. You can just see the little one nibbling his paw. Oh, I'm so tired now. Hello, monster. <laughs> and sitting here just to be able to describe this little one to you they look incredibly fluffy and cuddly oh and you so look at your eye contact oh you're so brave you are so brave <laughs> and they look incredibly fluffy and cuddly i do know from experience that that fur isn't quite as soft as it looks but they already got their enormous feet going They're very, very cute and also slightly smelly. I'm getting a little bit of a whiff of sort of wet dog combined with a bit of rotting meat. So, cuddly looking, but maybe not terribly cuddly. And there you can see it was definitely the twins' mom. We were right about that because she's currently suckling one of the younger ones. Now, if we were to be walking on foot through this area, they would definitely not be nearly as relaxed. You can see they are perfectly comfortable with the company of the car, but Bugsy wanted to know how hyenas would react to us walking, and the answer is that generally they tend to run away as fast as possible in the opposite direction, just to get away from us. I have seen, I have met one or two hyenas that are fairly relaxed on foot and I've also heard stories of hyenas following walking groups just out of, more out of curiosity than any kind of threat. And a hyena poses no serious threat to human life unless they are very sick or injured or trapped. But they are not known for attacking, hy attacking people who are walking around. Generally the accidents that you hear with hyenas is from people who are sleeping and they haven't put up an adequate watch system or a way of keeping the hyenas away from them and hyenas tend to explore with their mouths so you do hear stories of people getting bitten while they are sleeping out in the bush and then if hyenas are hand fed or fed around camps they become slightly more of a danger but typically wild hyenas like this Bugsy if we went walking if I got out of the car now or if I looped around and then approached on foot, they would be up and running, especially these three little cubs.
and a very peaceful, contented scene. So sleepy. Just blinking a little bit to keep out the morning light. So we've definitely made some progress here. I'm almost certain that the den site is not far from our position at the moment and I'm sure that the youngest cub is there. So what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to mark this position on my phone. I do know roughly where we are but I'm going to mark it on my phone because I think over the next few days a little walk around to the various termite mounds around us would be a very very good idea. I count at least three or four possible sites so excuse me for one second I'm just going to mark this and we will remember it and hopefully be closer to finding out where we are where or where the hyena den is very very close to this hyena den okay so we've got the GPS coordinates and we'll be keeping an eye out for them. So I've said a lot about the termite mounds and how they excavate, spot hyenas excavate in that area and then we chatted a little bit about the brown hyena den sites which is something that I would be incredibly keen to find. I don't think we've got the right sort of topography for that kind of thing but you never know. As I said I've seen them use termite mounds before and Peggy tells me, in answer to my question earlier when we were talking about hyena, brown hyenas, that she only remembers one being seen on Juma many years ago. So obviously something that is quite rare. And that is to be expected. We've got quite a high concentration of spotted hyenas and a quite a high leopard and lion population. So it could be just that the brown hyenas, this isn't the ideal environment for them. And they're a little bit more scarce here. And typically they tend to flourish more towards the more arid regions so into the Kalahari and Namibia around those kind of areas it's not as common to see them in the low felt bush felt <laughs> so so cute And they do have such an unfair reputation that they've garnered through various media and movies as being terrible scavengers who are dirty and thieves. But you can see, how can you not like that little face? And so beautifully adapted for the way that they operate. That nose can pick up on the smell of a carcass from a good couple of kilometers away. Sometimes it is nice to just sit and listen and enjoy the peacefulness of this scene. Over the next few months these three little cubs who are not so little anymore as we've started to notice over the last few days and the last few weeks they've started utilizing that den site less and less and they are going to get to the stage over the next few months where they don't really go back into those tunnels at all they're now big enough and fairly fast that they can escape from most threats they do need to be careful though they don't want to get too brave too quickly but their mothers are going to start pushing them, bringing them out more often away from the den towards the carcasses. And then if they are females, of course it is very hard to tell. 
Um, we're still trying to get a handle on that particular dynamic, but we've got three of them here, so I'm not sure how many males and females we have. We must have a look at some point, see if we can figure it out. At the moment, there's not enough interaction for us to be able to work it out. I suspect that the older one is a male, the seven-month-old one, but that's more a gut instinct than anything else. We'll have to wait and see. And the reason I think that is because I've actually seen him being bullied fairly extensively by some of the older females, yet his mother seems to be quite high-ranking in the group, just judging by her behavior. She's the hyena with the hole in her ear. And yet her cub is fairly bullied by some of the other members. So I think it's a possibility that it's a male. I've seen him picked up one by the tail and one by the neck and sort of pulled between two of them, despite his protesting yelps. So that's my theory that he's a male. And if he is a male, then he will be off in the next year or so to go and search for different clans and different mating opportunities. The rest of them, if they are females, will be, they will stay with their natal clan. So they'll stay around here. And I don't even think that that little cub is suckling at the moment. It's just sleeping up against mom. So I'm just quietly listening to the Game Drive channel. I just want to hear what their updates are on those lions. Okay, stop talking about the lions for now. I'll keep my ears out though for any information and I will promise to keep you all updated. These guys seem very contented and sort of half asleep and Diggy would like to know if any of the wild animals ever snore when they're asleep. And the answer to that is yes, I have definitely heard lions snuffling. They don't snore exactly like some humans have a chronic case of, but they do snuffle and they do snort in their sleep. I have heard them do it, much in the same way your pet dog might whilst it's lying, sleeping contentedly away. I'm trying to think which other animals I've seen snoring. I've definitely seen lions snore. I don't think I've heard any other animals snoring. But I'm sure that these hyenas would. And just in the distance I can hear a pearl spotted owlet calling, one of my favorite little owls. <whistles> hmm, my lips are too dry to actually do a proper <laughs> owlet call. It's August, it's a bit of a struggle. But they are wonderfully Cropuscular little birds, so it's very common to hear them early in the morning and then late in the evening just as it starts to get dark and my fav one of my favorite little owls, tiny tiny little things that always look incredibly grumpy and if on a day when my lips are not quite so chapped and I'm capable of producing a whistle that actually sounds like a whistle you can call them over and if you whistle nice and carefully and softly they'll actually fly across to you just to have a look at if there's a rival bird around. So I mentioned earlier that this little one here I think might be a male. 
and Sharon from Pittsburgh would like to know how you tell the difference. She asks, isn't it very difficult because the equipment does look very similar? And Sharon, the answer is yes, especially when they are young at this age. So for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, we have to have a little bit of a physical description of the way the spotted hyenas work because they are very, very unusual. The females are much, much larger. They have higher levels of testosterone than the males do. And that has actually led to an extending of the clitoris to produce a sort of pseudo penis that looks very, very similar to the male penis. And it's actually a fused tract between the urinary tract and the vagina, which is highly unusual. I don't know of any other mammals in which that happens. Obviously with birds it is the standard norm. But as far as I know, there aren't any other mammals who share that trait. I could be wrong, but it is very, very unusual. And what that means is that it can be very difficult to judge a hyena's sex, especially when they are young. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the book with me with the pictures in it. I do have a very good illustrative book that sort of shows that the end of the penis of the males is slightly different to that of the females. Um, but when they are young, that difference isn't very clear at all. The end of the males is slightly more bulbous. With some of the older females, they have to give birth through that pseudo penis. So it does tend to split open at the tip and it makes it a little bit easier to see. And then you have to also look at the nipples. Unfortunately, the nipples are back towards uh, between the back legs. So they can be confused with testicles, but the males have tiny, tiny testicles. And particularly adult mature females will have slightly larger nipples. And when they are suckling, then they become a lot clearer. But those are for mature adults. For these little ones, it becomes a little bit more tricky. The differences aren't clear unless they are very kindly being um, considerate and showing us exactly what they've got going on between their legs. But the best, probably in my experience, the best way of trying to sex hyena cubs is to watch their behavior and the way that they interact with each other and the way that they interact with other hyena. And that can be quite a complicated, you've got to spend a lot of time sitting and observing and starting to draw your own conclusions. And obviously you're not going to be accurate all of the time, but it can give you quite a good idea. At the moment, I have absolutely no clue whether the twins are male or female. Typically, if they were both female, there would be a lot more conflict between the two of them because then they start to fight for dominance. Whereas if there's one male and one female, then the male just automatically assumes the subservient role. So I've been asked, actually, I've been asked a question that I don't know the answer to and I should know the answer to. And the question comes from James, who would like to know where the word hyena comes from and what it means. Now, James, I don't know the answer to that and I should. I'm actually very curious now that you've asked it. And that is one of my favorite things about the questions that the viewers send through, is that it actually lets me think about stuff that I haven't necessarily considered and I don't know the answer to James's question, but I'm sure that some of you out there might. So if you do know where the word hyena comes from and what it means, please feel free to send it through on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or to questions at wildearth.tv. I'm just trying to rack my brains and think about it because I'm sure I used to know once upon a time. It's just one of those pieces of knowledge that is escaping me at the moment. Bear with me a moment. I just want to listen to what's happening on the radio.
Okay, so they're just talking about the fact they all, some of the guides are heading back across to Second Rock where that buffalo kill was, just to have a look at what's happening there. They haven't seemed to have located the lions yet. We were talking a little bit about the difference between brown hyenas and spotted hyenas and where they den. And Ginny from Virginia, welcome to the Sunrise Safari. Ginny would like to know if you can tell the difference between brown hyena or spotted hyena tracks. And the answer is yes, you absolutely can. However, I need you to keep watching and bear with me because I'd actually like to find a good example of a spotted hyena track for you and then use it to demonstrate the difference between brown hyena and spotted hyena which I can't do at the moment oh mum's got an itch I can't do that at the moment because obviously we've got all of these little guys around us but bear with me Ginny and when I get back out onto the road and I find a nice hyena track I will explain it to you but you definitely can and it's actually fairly easy to do oh mum's having a bit of a wash and a bit of a scratch. <laughs> and that little cub obviously had a spot there that mom was getting that was causing a leg twitch, like lots of dogs do when you scratch. Oh, this little one doesn't want to bath. Doing a little bit of complaining. Where are you off to, Mummy? To be, she's looking fairly full. They've obviously had a meal fairly recently. direction she goes off in because it looks as though these little cubs are going to hop up and follow her as well here we go Just heading off after mum. What a nice contented family scene. I'm just letting them get a little bit further away before I start my car, especially because I don't have the low range option, so I can't keep my revs low. But now, are you going to show us where that den site is? So as we follow on and see if these guys lead us to the den, I do have a great update from Sally about the origins of the word hyena. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that as I drive, but thank you very much for that Sally. I do appreciate it and it's always fascinating to hear where the various names come from and often the stories can be fairly funny. So Sally tells me that the word hyena has a middle English word that probably stems via Latin from the Greek, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but hyena, and it is a sort of feminine version of the word for pig. 
probably because the hyena's mane resembles the bristles of a wild boar. So very, very interesting. Not what I was expecting at all. So thank you for that, Sally. Absolutely fascinating. Interesting lesson in the history of the name hyena. Now, unfortunately, this is what I thought was going to happen. These little hyenas have moved off into this drainage line. Now, given Wendy's current slightly fragile state, I don't think I'm going to be rushing in after them. But it is a good start for us because we can start to learn about where they are denning. So she's, yeah, they've gone into this thick block. It is unfortunately for Wendy's current state of being. You can hear her protesting already. It is not going to be our best plan of action, especially without a jigger. So, Ginny, if you are still watching, what's happening there? Yes. They are still moving off into that block far away. Sorry, jean -Dre. There you can, they are just disappearing off into that thick stuff and you can see how very thick it is. So I'm not going to be putting Wendy through that today because then we could be stuck without any sunset safari this afternoon. So Ginny, I promised you a lesson on hyena tracks. And I do just want to see if I can find a nice fresh example for you and then I can demonstrate the difference between spotted and brown hyena tracks. Let's see what we can find on this road. They've crossed here, but the light wasn't fantastic. Quite an exciting morning. We did manage to fairly successfully track these hyena. Um, it was a lot of luck involved more than anything else. But Lynn, thank you for your comment that we managed to find them. And Lynn suggests that I could find a needle in the proverbial haystack. Um, there was a bit of luck involved, and there was definitely some good spotting from Jandre. But the nice thing about living and working out here is that you get to make lots of observations and you can build up evidence and stories in your head for days at a time and start to get an idea so the fact that i had lots of fresh hyena tracks was one thing but i've also noticed them pushing more and more into this direction from the last over the last week or so so it's a bit of guesswork a bit of supposition and then also just a lot of time spent observing and moving through the bush which helps a great deal what, what is over there isn't it like a stem rookie might be a bit tricky to see that looks like a day here we go we've got a little dacre tucked away off to my left So while we have a, a look at this little dacre, I just want to get hold of our tracking team and find out what's happening on that side of things. Brent, Brent, Brent for Jamie. Copy that, thanks Brent. Yeah, we had some nice messy here on Rebecca's Road where we think that they are still denning in this area. I think that they've left their old den site. Um, maybe if you can check on Gary Main and Triple M, see if there's any leopard in Konzo there. I 
Thank you. Okay, so the tracking team is out and about. They have checked most of the eastern side of the property and unfortunately they have found in Brent's words absolutely nothing. So it seems as though Juma is fairly quiet and we shall head off to see what else we can find. Eddie will start heading a bit towards the north, see if we can pick up on any of those wild dogs that we saw yesterday, although I highly, highly doubt it. I think they will have left by now. really nice clear tracks but this light isn't going to do us the best of favours. Let's get onto the top of this road and then I will show you some tracks. So we were looking at that little daycare earlier and they've got that amazing tuft of hair like a mohawk between their ears and the middle of their head and I'm not sure of the exact reason behind that but it is something that I've only recently noticed about them for some reason I've never looked closely at the top of their head but it is very very sweet to see I'm not sure if it's meant to imitate horns to make them seem a little bit more threatening I'm not sure maybe in the same way that baby warthogs have those tufts of bristles coming out of the side of their face to sort of look like they've started growing tusks when they haven't. So, let's go and examine some of the other drainage lines in the area. I'm trying to, it's amazing how instinctive it is, but I'm trying to drive Wendy really, really gently. Make sure that she stays in gear. Okay, well, since I haven't found a decent, nice, clear hyena track, I think I will just answer Ginny's question now. Um, I need my hands to demonstrate, so I'm going to stop for a moment. So Ginny, with spotted and brown hyena, now brown hyena typically have even more of a pronounced slope to their back, and that is partly because they are even more nomadic and move even greater distances than the spotted hyena. So they've got a very, very sloped and very clear difference between their powerful front end and a rather small back end. So when you're looking at hyena tracks, you will always see a size difference between the front and the back with both spotted and with brown but with back with brown hyena their backtrack is incredibly small it looks like there's a cub walking next to it but you know that it's still the same animal so if a spotted hyena has a front foot like this and then a back foot like this a brown hyena will have a similar sized front foot and then their back foot will actually be almost like this so there's a very very pronounced difference and if you are in a nice substrate like the soft, soft sand that we find here on the roads or in some really, really runny mud, the other thing that you also see is if you look really, really closely at the track, you'll start to see little points of hair around the track. And that's because the brown hyenas have got that shaggy, shaggy fur. So I was hoping to find a track to explain it, but you sort of get the idea that is how you tell the difference. And you'll also start to look in terms of especially if you see lots of tracks together it's probably not brown hyena it's probably spotted hyena so those are the main distinct differences
been chatting a lot about hyenas and telling the difference between male and female and Jeffrey from Austin tells me that in uh, according to old law as an understanding of the way that hyenas work people actually thought that they changed sex every season which of course would be down to the fact that nobody could really understand their anatomy and it's so so unusual in the animal kingdom you can imagine how it would have confused people I know that there were certain beliefs that hyenas were hermaphrodi hermaphrodites they're not they are distinctly different um, it's just a very interesting approach that evolution has adopted in terms of their development and it's one of those fascinating things that although there's a couple of theories as to why they are like that nobody fully can explain it all that we know is that the result of that is that the hyenas milk that they produce because they are so big and strong and the females are so dominant they get the access to the best parts of the kill the best food and are more than capable of kicking a male off a kill so the consequence is that their milk is the, probably the richest of all of the mammal milk out here, the most protein rich and the healthiest for their babies. So that is one consequence, it is not an explanation. It's still amazing to think that we don't know everything about these amazing animals. from one bristly animal to another. Josh, who is very much wide awake and a bit of an insomniac, welcome to the Sunrise Safari. I do hope we can keep you entertained in your sleepless state. And Josh would like to, he was talking a little bit about how in America there is a problem with wild boar, wild hogs becoming a problem animal, just increasing in number and compromising the natural habitat that they are in. And you would like to know if we have any similar problems in Africa. Um, Josh, to the best of my knowledge, not, not something similar within South Africa. Our biggest problem, apart from obviously human encroachment and habitat loss and poaching, is um, in terms of animal interference, it's probably domestic cats, which tend to, if they do enter an area like this, they tend to breed and hybridize with the African wildcat and start to sort of cause extinction of that natural species so definitely not something that is popular around here and if cats as far as I know nobody is allowed to have pet cats in this area and if they do um, if, if any wild if any sort of what's the word I'm looking for the feral ones feral that's the word I'm looking for if any feral ones do enter the reserve, they will be removed as quickly as possible just because they are such an incredible threat to an already endangered species. And I have yet to see an African wild cat here. I don't know if any of the viewers have, but it was something that would get me very, very excited if we did see one. I love them. I think they're beautiful animals. And the ancestor of our modern day domestic cats now somewhere on Juma somewhere on Juma there must be a leopard there must be more of averages there's got to be one wandering around here somewhere it sounds as though all of our lions are off to the south and to the east of us. You never know what else you may find. I'm just going nice and slowly here past the drainage line. Uh, 
while we're looking for the leopards tucked away in the drainage line somewhere which i'm sure there is at least one somewhere hidden away here reno would like to know if the increased line activity might mean that we're going to see less leopards are they going to go into hiding or try and disappear away from here and reno i don't think so i don't think it's going to have too much of an effect on the leopards the lions are distracted by their own dynamics so they are no more or less of a threat to the leopards than they would always have been another little daker tucked in there excuse me little daker have you seen any leopards oh there's two but they've run off into the bush there but no in answer to your question Rina, my opinion is that lions are dangerous to leopards regardless of what is happening in the lion world so the changes in dynamics might even mean that the leopards feel a bit more secure because they know that the leopards are distracted i mean the lions are distracted by their goings on with each other so i don't think we're going to see any noticeable difference that's just my personal opinion and it is a very delicate balance between the predators if you've got too many lions you immediately start to compromise the other smaller predators so the hyenas the cheetah the leopards they immediately start to struggle if you've got an overpopulation of lions and unfortunately that is one of the things that the lions are able to keep their own numbers down as we've seen a very good example of just yesterday so one of those natural things very very sad but one less lion might mean an increased chance of a leopard cub surviving so it all ties in together heading across to Treehouse Dam. At least I think I am. I'm trying to get to Treehouse Dam. I sort of took a turn a little bit earlier and I wasn't entirely sure where I was but I'm fairly certain this is where I want to be. And if it's not it doesn't really matter too much. The dams are really starting to dry out. Sorry guys, a bit of a signal dip. I do just want to get on media. I've heard something happening. Oh, got to Twin Dams by mistake. Sorry guys, a little bit of a black screen as I went through that dip there. I just want to hop onto the game drive radio and get hold of Craig who has an interesting report. I just want to find out where that particular animal is. And I didn't make it to Treehouse Dam, I made it to Twin Dams which is not quite where I expected to be but we'll go with it. I'm not entirely sure how I did that, I'm usually quite okay on Juba's roads. <laughs> Obviously too busy yakking away to pay attention to where I was. Standing by.
friend, sorry, your message wasn't very clear. Can you just repeat? Copy that. Um, just repeat one more time. What is the position of that in law? Copy that. Thank you. Craig, Craig, for Jenny. Sorry, guys. guys if you were experiencing some signal issues uh, we seem to be back up and running and I have heard reports of a nice big Ellie ball just to the north of our position so we're going to head across to there but we do apologize for some signal breakups so I was just as I was driving along there I was in contact with Craig who called in Karula now unfortunately she's on Buffles Hook, but she is slowly mobile sort of southeast, so she might be coming to our direction later this afternoon. But for the moment she is beyond our boundaries, but great to hear that Karula is out and about and up north in Buffles Hook. While I am making my way towards this Ellie, Jenna from Oregon, welcome to the Sunrise Safari. Jenna asks what it was that made me decide to become a safari guide and whether what some of my favorite animals are. Um, Jenna, it's quite a long story. I really, really, really wanted to either do this or be a wildlife vet. Unfortunately, I'm hugely allergic to animals, which in life makes that kind of work a little bit difficult um, especially in working in various vet practices with close contact with lots of different species so that's I could not I couldn't be a wildlife vet but I was um, when I was little my family always loved traveling through the bush and my grandfather in particular inspired that sort of love of the outdoors in me. He used to work as a game warden amongst many other things during his life and I spent a great deal of time, I have very fond memories of sitting in his study 
moved, sort of working my way through his various animal textbooks and sketches. And I've always had that deep, deep fascination with nature and the outdoors. And then when I was about eight years old, my little brother had just been born. And we went to a place called the Rhino Camp in Lapalala. And they took me out on walks. I was allowed to walk around that area and I just absolutely fell in love with it. So from a very early age, I've always felt, it's hard to explain, but it's always like I felt the most myself when I'm in the bush, the most natural, the most at ease. I find that I do tend to get, especially now that I live out in the bush permanently, I do tend to feel fairly uncomfortable in cities now. I struggle to adapt back to that style of living. But that is the answer to that question. In terms of my favorite animals, almost impossible for me to answer that. Um, I do love spotted hyenas because they are so interesting and they've got such a fascinating dynamic. But I do also really, really love rhino. I always have. They are the animal that I feel truly inspired me during my time in the rhino camp. And after that, when I was little, I used to research on all of the different species of rhino. I learned everything I could about them. And they still remain to me one of my favorite animals to watch and to see. And I've also been fortunate enough in the past to spend quite a lot of time working with them. So there are animals that I'm fairly, fairly familiar with. While we are chatting about my particular background, Carol would like to know where I'm from. Carol, welcome to the Sunrise Safari. It's great to have you on the back with us. I am originally from Johannesburg. I was born and grew up there. I was schooled there. And I spent most of my childhood, I've lived in the same house. My parents have been in the same house in Johannesburg my entire life. Then when I was 19, I worked a little bit in the Kalahari, which was also something that truly cemented in me the idea that this was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And then I moved to the UK for three years, which is why my accent maybe is not as South African as it could be. I've still got a little bit of a, sort of, I don't know, a bit of an English lilt to the accent that I have, but that is why I lived there for three years. And I got tired of being teased about my South African use of something like, for example, off, get off, as opposed to get off. So I started to adapt a little bit the way that I spoke and somehow it stuck around even after I moved back here about three years ago. I'm just coming past the treehouse dam now. I want to see if there's any nice birds around. And I have a feeling that if it does rain again, if it does rain heavily in the next season this damn wall is going to need some serious TLC it's starting to feel a little bit like there's danger at every turn and every bump as we go across it there's actually quite a lot of water here still but absolutely no activity but I am keen to see that Ellie I do really, really love elephants. I find them hugely entertaining. So let us press on in that direction. Amanda from Alabama, USA would like to know if I've ever been to visit the USA and the answer to that is no I haven't. My parents have been. The last time they went I believe I was writing school exams so unfortunately I couldn't go with them. So it is definitely on my wish list. I have a very strong burning desire to road trip through America. I haven't quite decided where I would like to go but I would be hugely keen to do that. 
And obviously in the course of my work with various tourists coming through to South Africa, I have met lots and lots of Americans. And I love hearing stories and how different, how vastly different the various parts of America can be. So something that's definitely on my wish list. With our exchange rate, our current South African exchange rate, however, if I do go, I'm probably going to have to be very careful about what I spend my money on. We are busy discussing a little bit about my background and since the bush seems to be fairly devoid of most life forms, Jim would like to know a little bit about my educational background. Um, I have a bit of an interesting one in that respect. I was schooled in South Africa, obviously I completed my schooling there. I then went to a sixth form college to do an extra year of school and I did my A-levels there and the reason behind that was I had private an offer of private sponsorship to go to a university overseas and it was a little bit easier to do so with A-level qualifications because I was quite keen on going to an English university. So I did my A-levels and then I went off to the Kalahari and during that time I'd applied for a degree from Cambridge and I went across did the interview and got in but I still have no idea how because I believe I spent most of my time arguing with the interviewer but somehow that worked in my favour. So I did a three year law degree and I was very very fortunate to have had that opportunity. There are not many South Africans who are lucky enough to get that kind of sponsorship and I still remain very grateful. What I did discover during that time though is that law was not really for me. Um, I was not very good at it at all, especially in the beginning. I did get better, especially as I was able to start specializing in subjects that I found a little bit more interesting. So I discovered that if I could specialize a little bit in international law and start to sort of edge around that in environmental law, that helped me and I got a lot better at it. But definitely, I was definitely not born to practice law. I never qualified to practice after I completed the degree. And I came straight back to do my training to come and work in the bush. And I spent six months doing some training and then another six months working as an unpaid intern. And then I continued my work as a research guide at a volunteer organization. So that's just a little bit about my background. My law degree flirtation was one I'm very grateful for, but not something I will be planning on continuing. We've just got some zebras off to our left. Unfortunately, they are moving off, but it's nice to see some life out here. And here the drongos following behind them. And I'm fairly certain they are on their way to Treehouse Dam for a drink. Off they go. And I've only seen two of them, but I'm not sure if there are more hiding around in there. You can hear the drum go chirping as it follows behind them to catch all of the bugs that they stir up. So, Diggy on Twitter has noticed as we saw those zebra disappearing that zebras have black spots on the inside of their legs, sort of up towards their elbows, or what we think of as their elbows. And those are just rough calloused areas. That's quite similar to something that you get in horses. Now, we're not sure of the exact purpose behind them, but I think it's to do with the fact that 
when they lie down, it just stops the hooves from rubbing on the inside of the leg. Now, as far as I know, there's no scent glands or anything attached to those. It is just rough patches of skin. But I will have a look and do some more reading up on that because a lot of people have been pointing those out to me recently. So I am curious to know a little bit more about them. So guys, our zebras have disappeared. And as I said, Wendy needs some gentle driving. So we're not going to be following up on them. But I do still want to make my way to where Brent saw those elephant tracks just see what's happening up on Impala Road and Impala Road is a good place to be there's been a lot of action there over the last few weeks we had a shadow and Sandile wandering around with the wild dogs crossing through there yesterday morning so let's see what's happening on that side of things